All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out and joining us here at uh, the, the library's virtual space for another Red in Rye program. I'm Chris Shoemaker. I'm the director here at the library, and it is my pleasure to be your, um, your host tonight. I'm very excited able to host our author tonight. She has a fantastic connection with the Rye Free Reading Room. She served as a member of the Board of Trustees um, for several years and even served as the library president from 2004 to 2005, just as all the amazing construction for the meeting room um, and the library expansion was finishing up. Um, so thank you, Florence, for making that space possible, um, along with Peggy Peters and so many others. We truly would not be able to do what we would like to do at the library <laughs> without that space. Um, and just thank you for your dedication to the library and for everything you did for the community um, as a trustee and for everything you are doing for the community as a local author. Um, Florence is a uh, Rye resident. She is a native New Yorker. Um, she was raised in New York City. She holds a bachelor's of English and a master's in social work. She has experience as a family service agency CEO, a clinician, a family therapist, and a prolific writer and essayist. Uh, she has devoted herself to traveling and writing. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, and her fiction has appeared in the Evening Star Press, the Westchester Review, and many more publications. We're thrilled to have Florence here tonight to celebrate the, um, the, the launch, well, the second event of her debut novel, How to Make a Life. How to Make a Life is a compelling story that examines a family's uh, journey and struggle and triumph and uh, interpersonal relationships over a generation uh, from the uh, pogroms of the Ukraine to the development of the Lower East Side to uh, the, the diaspora of family uh, across the city and across the nation. Um, Florence, we're so honored to be able to have you here tonight and thank you for joining us. Let's give you a round of applause, which in this case <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Uh, it's a, it is such a pleasure for me to be here because this is my library, of course. Um, I raised my children in the Rye Library. We used to say that the biggest sin was not bringing the library books back. And, um, and I had the pleasure of raising a couple of my grandchildren. Now, I didn't raise them. <laughs> but, but them you know, I brought them to the library and some of the uh, staff at the library remembers them and knows them well. So um, this is very, it, the Rye Free Reading Room is very dear to my heart. Oh, I'm well, delighted to be here. Yes, we're, we're thrilled. We're um, glad to be hosting you. And um, I'm really looking forward to talking about your 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 work and sort of how it came to be, um, who, who you identify with within it, um, and just the, your overall approach to writing. Um, I know that some of our attendees may have had the chance to read it, um, and some of them uh, are, are probably uh, waiting for a copy from Patrick or from Amazon. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, would you just give us a brief synopsis of, sure. of your book? Right. Um, the book is uh, what I, I, I call a family saga because it does go, it traces four generations of an immigrant family uh, who came to the United States in 1905, fleeing a pogrom from Ukraine and um, raised their family mostly in New York. The, the, there are five children in the next generation and we follow them as they grow and have families and get old themselves. Um, and uh, the, the book really uh, emphasizes how choices and uh, events in one generation's life affects what happens in the next generations. And I think that um, that's the theme that goes through uh, the book whether it's trauma or joy or whatever it is, um, one generation affects the next. 
in reading it, uh, that was one of the things that I, I most noted. You deal so expertly uh, in both subtle ways and direct ways of the intergenerational trauma and intergenerational emotional impact that each person has on both their um, ancestors and their descendants. How, how did you go about bringing that to the page since it is something that we tend to have in the background and, and not something that we consciously reflect on? Well, of course, I, I probably my social work background had an impact on that because I'm in working for 30 years with families, I saw that again and again and again. Um, but I wanna start a little bit with myself because I come from a huge family. And um, when I grew up, I had 27 first cousins and 24 aunts and uncles. And I used to listen to the stories that were told at, around the coffee clutches. And that was um, a way that I saw how things impacted people. So that's why I became a social worker. That's why I worked in a family service agency. I always was interested in family. Um, the, the idea of trauma, as I said, came from my, um, my social, social work background, but I really started with the people um, and the seminal incident. I also, um, you didn't ask this, but um, when I first started the book many years ago, it was, um, there were a, a few short stories and I published those short stories. They were interesting characters to me. And, um, and then I began to think they really linked together. They were a family. And that is how it developed into a novel. So I did it a hard. I did it the hard way. <laughs> I on your blog actually are some of the posts are, are some of your fiction posts either earlier bits of this or or things that didn't quite fit into the yes. overall novel. Okay, very <laughs> very astute. Um, actually, some of the uh, stories that are there are two of them particularly, and and I have more. Uh, were things that sort of didn't make the cut, not because the characters were not part of the family, because in a way they were, but because I felt that the action in the story did not move the action of the family in the, the whole way the family moved. So that was, um, that was why they didn't stay in the book, mm -hmm. uh, even though I, they, it was very difficult to cut them out because they say, you know, you have to kill your little darlings. And uh, I, I really loved the, those stories, so. I, I don't think I, I think I can say this without giving away an ending or anything, um, but I, how the, the sort of ending scene of the book is, is a massive gathering. I can only imagine that must have been influenced by having uh, all the first cousins and family <laughs> gathered together for coffee. Uh, well, it actually, um, it, the idea of a, of a uh, huge ga gathering is something that was, we've done many, many times in my family. So um, yes, that was influenced by real life. <laughs> in, in, in terms of uh, the, the stories and, and building that large family, um, your novel is so complex, covering multiple generations and um, different branches of the family tree. Uh, when you are going about this process, are you an outliner or are you a writer and then you, you cut to fit the structure that you need? Very interesting, I think. <laughs> because it's so, it was so complex to do this. I, I would not recommend this as a way to do a first novel, but um, I actually had to do 
an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> and the different colors are the different generations. Uh, because I did it over a hundred years, I did it uh, chronologically. So I started with the first generation and moved and selected different people in the family for different times in the, in the world. And they traveled and you know they had different experiences. One of the ongoing themes, of course, is uh, the theme of how mental illness impacts everybody in the family. Uh, and it doesn't have to be mental illness. It could be any, um, anything that is slightly dysfunctional it can impact everybody, uh, whether it's gambling or alcoholism or uh, well, mental illness or just any of the, the myriad problems that families have, we, uh, they, they impact everybody in the family. And you see that in this book. That was one of the themes that I brought through the generations. And that was a very important theme. So that helped me to define. <laughs> I was glad that I had a digital copy of this because I actually did print out the family tree. Did and, you? I, and I kept it to the side as I was reading it. Right. Um, it, it, was, it was an essential resource uh, because right. I, when I was reading it, um, you have that, your, your great, time blocking uh, over each sort of episode. Um, and occasionally I would be like, wait, no, that's this person. <laughs> and, and kind of jump back right. to generation. I'm sorry if I caused you concern. But no. one of the things I had to do really what, with this map that I did was try to figure out, well, okay, so now it's 1964. How old is Sarah in 1964? And how old was she uh, in 1979, when she has another experience, those were very important uh, dates, and I I had to make them all come out. Um, Did you yeah. link those dates to? Uh, in some cases, they are linked to notable events in right. history. In other cases. It, it's a little more amorphous. So right. were those important dates to you, or did it just feel at, like the right chunk of time? Um, well, first of all, I tried, tried very hard not to have huge gaps in time. Um, I wanted to bring in the outside world because I think the outside world does impact. So things like the um, uh, Woodstock was mm -hmm. important to a particular character. Um, but I didn't use the Vietnam War because I, I felt that that would take that would take over, the, that was so um, huge. But I had the civil rights movement as something that impacted one of the characters. And of course, World War II was a very important um, time for the family, the first generation of the family that was born in the United States, um, et cetera. Yeah, so I, I did, I tried to use some of the events, but Obviously not all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, you're, you would be trying to cram a hundred and right, exactly six years of history into right. a three hundred page novel. Three hundred pages, right? <laughs> <laughs> In ter when you touch on mental illness, um, without delving into um, family history, what led you to include to to have that as an element rather than? you know, something more like alcoholism um, mm -hmm. or, I mean, you touch on- Well, I had some gambling in it, yeah. A little bit, um, but what was the, what shaped that character's background? Um, well, as I said, I had a very large family. So there's practically no one of those problems that has not crept up in our family in certain lines of the family. We've had them all. And, um, but I was particularly uh, aware of how mental illness impacted the, the generation that I, kn I knew of. And I mean, as I said, there were 
there was gambling in the family, there was uh, too much drinking, there, there were all the things that happen in families. But um, it's, it, it was a particular, um, it, it was an important issue for my family. And so not my, not my family, but my larger family. And I wanted to include it. In, in turn, uh, you, so you, you touch on a lot of really weighty topics in addition to mental illness and alcoholism and gambling. Um, there's elements of um, immigrant assimilation into larger, to dominant cultures, um, converting and religious identities, um, multiculturalism. How, if you were to explore, you know, how to make a life the sequel or making a life or whatever a, a companion might be, um, would you narrow the focus to delve more deeply into one of those uh, elements? Absolutely. Uh, I don't think I would um, attempt to, you know, continue this kind of a, a broad way of looking at, at things. I definitely, uh, in my whatever next novel I do, will absolutely be more focused um, on either an issue or a character and their, um, you know, what they're struggling with and grappling with. But this was a story, the story of a family was mm -hmm. something that I, when I was a very little girl, I said, I'm gonna write a story about the family. Well, it's not the family, but it is a family, right? So. With, with crafting over multiple generations and so many characters, what were some of the challenges that you ran into? I, I mean, you've showed us your, your spreadsheet to keep track of people, um, but in terms of you know, tracking history or developing a character's voice and personality, um, interrelating plot points, how, how did you handle all that? And was, what, were there any struggles? There were a lot of struggles, of course there were. Um, if, but overall what drove it was the character. Um, I tried to make each person in the book a real, a real person so that their impulses and the things that they did are, come out of who they are. And that was what drove me along. Yes, of course they interact. And so you have to think about, uh, for instance, there are, um, there are four sisters and what are their relationships to one another and why? A sisterhood was a theme in my family for, uh, you know, because there were a lot of sisters. Uh, I never had a sister. So, um, but in, in looking at the characters and how they interacted and what the issues that they had with one another. Um, I was very mindful of not just their character, but how do they interact in a family? Um, so yeah, it was a struggle. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the characters that stood out to me, especially in handling that level of conflict was Jenny. Um, <laughs> how how she sort of I, I self-identified as shouldering the burdens um, right. across a couple of of generations not only um, with her her parents um, but then her siblings and then her nieces and nephews right. um, you know watching watching her character develop over the course of of the novel and seeing, what her resolution would be. Um, did you start with, uh, once you started mixing generations, did you build an outline for each character to follow or just make notes of this will be the point connected to this sibling or this uh, descendant and, um, and craft from there? I didn't have an outline that you're talking about. Um, I, I had the characters that, the main characters that I wanted to move with through the years. Jenny is definitely a, 
unifying person. And I don't, I think that in many families, there's a Jenny, a person who takes, who everybody goes to, to solve problems, who takes on the mantle of fixing. And yet, of course, I didn't want to make her um, a goody two shoes, you know, who's no, spending she's, her whole life, but she struggles with her own issues. Yeah, and, she definitely has flaws, which and definitely she's, she's not to have a superhero. That's right. That's that's exactly right. And so that was very important that she not that you the readers not feel that Jenny was not a real person. Um, but I do think that families have people like Jenny, who are uh, the weavers and the. The, the ones that people go to, to, to help them. Um, at least I know in my family, we had a couple of them. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I Jenny think, reflects that. I think every family can also identify their roof as well. Um, <laughs> whether it's, whether it's a, um, a mental illness or the, a uh, the, Ruby, the family member, a Ruby, yes. Ruby, right. uh, Who's the, the one who's a little bit more flighty, who- Yes, of course, you know, you're like, absolutely. But you know, when like, you're an author, what you often do is um, you expand it. I mean, because as, as we know, people don't want to read about how everything is terrific and just keeps going on. You have to have problems. If you don't have problems, there's, there's no interest. Right. Um, so I gave my characters lots of problems. And lots of, of the light, well, over a hundred years, mm -hmm. lots of, of sad things happen. And um, so that was an interesting tension for me also. Did I put in, um, you know, was it, was it well-balanced, the, the good things and the bad things, so. Yeah, I, yeah you, you don't wanna end up uh, on a, a well, there is a place for a saccharine book. Um, right. I don't think that would be what you were trying to do with a no. multi-generational family narrative. And right. then there's exactly. a place for the bleak novel. And <laughs> <laughs> while that might make for a, a, a pretty good uh, streaming television show, it probably is not the case of what you wanted to go for either. No, no. When I was reading this um, and having looked up your background, I naturally assumed that um, Morris and Joseph would be your most personal characters, given their background in social work um, and the civil rights movement and, and sort of uh, community justice. Um, am I entirely off base with, with that? Well, certainly those pieces of Joseph, you know, his interest in uh, justice and civil rights and all of that did definitely come from my um, my life, um, and I wouldn't, you know, Morris is not doesn't come from me, but comes from other people that I knew. Um, he's a, a a character that I admire very much, um, but he does he's not he's not somebody that I related to. I mean. I, let me back off that. I relate to all the characters. There's a piece of me in every single one of them, uh, even probably Ruby. You know, she's kind of uh, flighty and wild, and um, I think I think I relate to certain things that she experienced. Um, so they all are a piece of me. Um, I, yeah, I can't pick one of them, yeah. but but certain of their experiences, I could say. Mm -hmm you know, come out of, out of things that I experienced, of course, because they're my characters. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, you, you talk about how obviously each character has a little piece of, of you. When you were um, building their personalities and voices, did any of, did, did any of them leap into your mind uh, and you were able to hear their voice or was it a, a gradual, um, building a volume from remembering of family members and cousins and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, building that. Um, I think it's a, it's a little of both. Um, sometimes 
the, the character is really fully formed. But then as you start working with them, they change. And then as you work through time, they change again. Uh, so I can't say that I outlined them and I said, well, now I'm gonna have a character who, but there were certain events that came into their life. And then with the character that I had formed, to me, they had to respond in a certain way because that was who they were. So if somebody had a loss in their uh, life, they would respond in one way and somebody else would respond in another way. Um, so I tried to make them true to who they were becoming as I wrote. Mm -hmm. But I went through four, I think four iterations of this book. And it, you know, and so some of the stories that you read, I took out because they were not relevant. Um, for instance, I mean, the, one of my favorite stories that I have ever written was a normal man, the, the, the one about the, the guy who is a yoga, you know, does yoga and mm -hmm. has this terrible experience where his wife leaves him. But I couldn't, I, I had a place for it in the book, but then I had to take it out because it just was taking up space and it wasn't moving the plot along. Um, so I, I took out, I put in, then I said I had to have something had to move the person from here to where they were 15 years later so that I had to have another story. So that's, that's how that happened. It was really an evolution. I, I, I should note for all our attendees that um, the, the stories are posted on Florence's blog, which I'll put the link to in the chat so that everyone can see it for reference. Um, a normal man, how to make a life, uh, sort of the, uh, which um, is connected with the novel, but deals with some characters that we meet later in the book. Right, right, right. T towards the, uh, well, Morris has a certain level of wanderlust um, and uh, S several of the sisters uh, also do some traveling um, as the story progresses. Is any of that um, drawn from your own travels or yes. uh, destinations? Yeah, I mean, any place I put a person, I have been. I have seen it, I've experienced it. So I, you know, I didn't have those things happen to me, but I had the smells and the sounds and the um, feelings of the, the, uh, the place. So if it's Spain, I was there. Or if, you know, India, I was there. Because um, I did a lot of traveling before, mm -hmm. before COVID. <laughs> and I hope to do it after as well. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Are you, uh, did you want me to do some readings or? or yeah, I have, one more question. I have one more question for you. Oh, then okay. We'll readings and then get uh, some uh, questions from the audience. Okay, great. One of the things that I appreciated uh, over the course of reading it was you have this ability to craft a sense of togetherness and isolation, often within the same moments of a character being on the page. Um, they are lost in their thoughts while surrounded by family or while mm -hmm. in engaging with uh, people around them. How did you go about crafting that family dynamic, which is so, which crystallizes so much what we all experience? Well, that's why, because it, of course, this is how I think we are in, in families. Um, there are moments when we're completely engulfed in the relationships and everything we're watching. And then there are the moments when we're really withdrawn and watching everything. And the characters do that, especially when they're experiencing any kind of a, a crisis or a um, conflict. Uh, then, you know, they withdraw, they come back in. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I, I crafted it because that's <laughs> That's my experience of family. And I'm glad to hear it's yours also. 
Um, well, wonderful. Well, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, get a, a, a sense of everyone um, in the novel from you if you have a couple of passages. I do, I have a couple of uh, passages that I picked out. They are, for those of you who went, were at the Harrison launch, they're different. They're not the same ones. <laughs> um, the first one, I wanted to give you an idea of how um, Ruby is experienced by, by Jenny and the family. So this is um, a scene that happens when Ruby has become engaged to a victim and um, how Jenny is reacting to that. Jenny is the youngest sister, Ruby is the oldest. In early February, 1942, Ruby and Victor announced that they would marry. Bessie and Abe beamed. There were congratulatory cries of mazel tov from everyone around the table. Jenny sat with her mouth open and finally dipped her head, nodded and mumbled congratulations. Glad that no one seemed to be looking at her except her grandmother. Jenny got up and began to clear the dishes from the table and Bubby Ida followed her. You don't like him? She asked. No, of course I like him. He's a wonderful man. Jenny scraped the remains from the dishes into the garbage pail while her grandmother filled the sink with hot water. I just don't see how he can marry her, Jenny burst out. Does he know? Bubby Ida shrugged. I didn't tell him. Someone should, Jenny said. It won't be me. Mama thinks getting married is going to solve Ruby's problems. It won't. How do you know? It might make things better. Jenny shook her head. No, it won't. Maybe it will for a while, but it won't last. He doesn't know what he's getting into. Someone has to tell him. Bessie poked her head into the kitchen. Come, she said, we're toasting them. Jenny and Bubby Ida went into the dining room. Right now, Jenny thought, Ruby looked and acted perfectly normal. She wasn't talking fast. Her laugh was not too loud, not too wild. If Jenny hadn't seen for herself how unseen spirits and voices could possess her sister, she wouldn't have believed there was anything wrong with her. Ruby hugged Jenny and said, there you are, little sister, my best friend in the world. Aren't you happy for me? Jenny could only hug her back and whisper, of course I am. But that night she could not sleep. And in the morning, she went to Bessie in the kitchen and said, Mama, did you or Papa tell Victor about Ruby? Tell what? Don't be like that, you know what? How she gets sometimes. Papa talked to him. He understands she is high strung. Jenny was exasperated. She's more than high strung. You know she is. I know that she will be happy and calm when she becomes a wife and mother. And you, Bessie glared at Jenny, mind your business. She walked out of the room. But Jenny could not let it go. Jenny knew Victor could not possibly understand about Ruby. If he did, he would never marry her. So I think that frames <laughs> some of the experience of some of the family members and how they react mm -hmm. to Ruby's issues and problems. So. Yeah, the, the same way we often do to similar problems in our own. Uh, yes, we, of course. We either and, have to talk about it or no, we're not gonna talk or about it. Or nobody's gonna talk about it, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Right. You just have to wait it out. <laughs> uh, well, we have a couple of questions that have come in, um, and then uh, I had another uh, a, another brief thing. If you want me to read it with another character, I don't know the you know I don't have to. We if you have the if the questions are no, we can um, if you want to do this the next section, and then uh, we'll have some more questions come in. I'm sure. Okay, so um, this is. Uh, Joseph, you mentioned him. He is um, Ruby's son, her first child. 
and he is has gone to law school, but he's very confused about what he wants to do in his life. He has had a lot of experience working with the civil rights movement and doing you know all kinds of, of things, but he really doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. So he goes to Israel where he has cousins to visit them on a kibbutz. And he is there during the 1973 Yom Kippur War when his cousin goes into the army and unfortunately is uh, killed. And so in this scene, he is with his cousin's girlfriend um, and he's very, um, he's sitting with her and he's very, very sad. I miss him, Joseph whispered, and he started to cry, his shoulders heaving. Shoshana stroked his arm, he rubbed his eyes. I'm not used to crying, men don't cry much in America. I only saw my father cry once in my whole life. How sad not to be able to cry. Why did he cry then? I was very little when I saw him. I remember I just had my fourth birthday, so it must have been 1947. We were at my grandparents' house and they were all sitting at the dining room table. My father was holding a letter. He said, they are all dead. They must be all dead. I didn't know what he was talking about, but he was sobbing. That's why I remember it. I had never seen him cry before. Joseph shifted against the wall. Years later, I figured it out. They were looking for their relatives, the ones they had left behind in Europe. My grandfather had a sister and her family in Poland, and my father's whole family was in Germany, except for Alfred. They were writing letters, searching lists, and I guess that day, my father realized that his whole family was dead. They were silent for a long time. Then Shoshana said, what did he do? Nothing, he went on. Joseph heard the in, out, in, out of Shoshana's slow breath. What do they do here, all the people who lose someone? Do they marry again, the widows? If they can find someone, then she said with characteristic Israeli bluntness, are you asking me if I'll find someone? Will you? I hope so. I can't think of it now, but someday, and I will have a child and name him after David. Aren't you afraid that there will be other wars? Yes, now I am, but we go on. That's what we do. I don't know how you do it, Joseph said. Ain bre rasha, Shana said, no choice. I'm afraid, afraid to have a child. You? Shoshana was shocked. What are you afraid of? From America, the big land of safety, of wealth? He didn't want to answer. Some fears you don't say out loud. But then in the darkness, with the warmth of Shoshana near him, he said, I'm afraid I'll have a child who is crazy like my mother. What do you mean crazy? Mentally ill, Joseph said. My mother is mentally ill. It was the first time he had said it out loud. There was a big intake of breath from Shoshana. But is it better to have no child at all? The question hung in the air for a long time. Shoshana fell asleep with her head on his chest, while Joseph lay with his hands over his eyes, thinking. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, well, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's a, a perfect transition, actually, because it, it, it is a, a powerful um, passage for, for thought and implications of what else is going on in the story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Arlene had a, a question. Um, how did you choose which characters were, would have expanded roles and which ones would, you know, would... Be minor characters. <laughs> uh, that's good. That's a very good question. And I struggled with it. So um, I started out with the uh, matriarch, and I 
she was very important in the formation of the family. But when they came and her, uh, the daughter that she came with formed her family, there were five children. And I, from the beginning, I knew that those five children would be, have important roles. Um, they each formed their own families and they each had, they stumbled and they had uh, good things happen and sad things happen, but they were all in very important characters, all five of them. And then I had the question of the next generation. Um, so the two major characters in the next generation uh, that I selected were Ruby and Victor's children. And that, that went because of the theme of, um, you know, the struggles that everybody had with Ruby and everything that she did that impacted their lives. And then I selected one more character. Well, and this is, by the way, why I don't have that story that I love so much in the book, <laughs> because I didn't want to have too many of the last generation. And then I have one more character that has a, an important um, role. And that is, um, that was Joseph's son. So, and daughter, the, that's a, mm -hmm. their children. So I, I really traced Victor and Ruby's family through three generations and all the rest of them, their children were minor characters. Yeah. But the five were, were the main characters. And that's the way that I did it. I could have done more, but the book would have been a thousand pages. <laughs> <laughs> I, I felt that um, Joseph's son was a, a good contrast with his aunt, both of them exploring religion um, mm -hmm. and uh, what faith means to them and what, what cultural uh, expressions mean to them. So yeah. um, I, 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 I enjoyed that element of their journey um, as a side note. <laughs> with because this is a, a family novel and is inspired by your experiences with family um how are your family reacting to the book have you gotten <laughs> why why am i on why am i this character or very funny that you should ask that um i have heard from some of my family and not not all of them and i'm sure that many of them are reading it and some of them haven't gotten it yet. They live in, in Israel and Switzerland, so the book is not available. Um, but yes, a couple of people have said, well, that character is interesting. You know, did you build it off me? <laughs> My answer to all of them is, um, this is, it's a novel. And of course I took from my own experiences, but none of them are you or your sister or your brother, they're all, um, they're manufactured, but sometimes manufactured from experiences and, um, you know, people that I, I know. I think all authors do that, mm -hmm. so. Um, and you mentioned you have been working uh, on this book for a little while. For, uh, yes, I have. <laughs> How long did it take to sort of arrive at this final draft? Uh, from start to finish, when I started writing stories. Uh-huh. Mm, I think it probably, I, you know, every time somebody asks me that question, I give them a different answer. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes I think it was uh, eight years, and sometimes I think it was more like 10. Um, but I, I, I think probably eight years is, is really the... Um, if I don't count this last year when it was being published, <laughs> the, the I wasn't really writing it, but um, yeah, it, I think it was about, it, it did take a very long time. Of course, I wasn't working full time mm -hmm. at writing. I had a, another job, <laughs> so. Um, uh, so uh, another question, uh, your description of many places and events are quite realistic, even though they were places and events that you would not have been alive to attend or participate in. Um, right. How did you go about doing your research for historical events and places? Um, well, I just, God bless the internet. That's all <laughs> I can say. Um, 
I, because I did a lot of research on the internet and I was very, um, I wanted to make sure that everything was historically accurate. Um, so when the book started obviously in 1905, I was not alive and I was not in Ukraine, but I did a lot of reading and research about that and the pogroms. Um, and, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of movies and things about the Lower East Side, so I certainly knew, mm -hmm. you know, in my, my own family stories about their early years, my, my parents uh, growing up, they were poor. They, they were like that. They lived in Brooklyn and in a crowded apartments. And so that part of it was very much um, lived experience. Uh, the places, the other places, as I said, I were all places that I have been. Um, and uh, yeah, so I did research on those things that I didn't know about. And I tried to really write about things that I did. Mm -hmm. um, another question's come in. As an author, how do you structure your writing time? Is it a specific period? Is it when inspiration strikes you? Do you do you follow a set schedule or word count? Uh, I wish. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've written all my life. And, and at different times in my, my life, I follow different ways of doing it. I would, uh, for a number of years, I would wake up at five in the morning and go downstairs and write for two hours or an hour and a half before I got the children up or went to, to work. Uh, at another time in my life, uh, my kids were very, were young and I hired a babysitter and I, during the morning and I was writing in the, after, in, in the morning while she was watching the kids. And, um, and then when I was working full time at a very, very demanding job, um, I, I would, I didn't have a, uh, a, uh, an everyday writing, but I did, I did write the bulk of the book during that time. So uh, I was always writing, but there I, I have never established a, this is how I do it and I do it, you know, all the time like this. Um, I'm hoping I'll be able to do that now. <laughs> this is finished and I, you know, so. Um, for uh, people on the uh, uh, interview who are thinking of their own work and um, publishing journey, could you talk a little bit about your journey to publication here, how you um, decided to go with your publisher and how you crafted everything? Well, I think, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a very good question for anybody who's seriously looking into writing because now writing is... Uh, publishing and writing is so different than it was when, when I started. Um, and there were so many big publishing companies and you could send your work to them. And, you know, they had slush piles and people would read through them and then they would get in touch with you. Very, very different. Now you have to have an agent and the agents are very difficult to, it's very difficult to get an agent if you don't have a connection. So I, but I did, you know, I, I've had a lot of teachers, I've taken a lot of classes. Um, and so I had people who were trying to help me on their way, on, on my way. Uh, however, I never, I had a lot of interest, but I never made that final push. Um, so I started looking at what they call hybrid publishers, which is what She Writes Press is. It's an indie press and it's very, very well respected. It's a fabulous organization for, especially for women writers. Um, and uh, they vet their writers. They don't take anyone. I mean, it's not, it's not self-publishing. You, you have to pass their standards, but you do have to share in the, the cost of the, the publishing. They give you, you know, they do the, people have asked me how you got the cover. They had, all, they had an artist who worked with me and I gave her my ideas and she came back with other ones and, and that was all part of it and, and setting the book and all of that is all done like a regular publishing. And they have 
uh, the distribution is through Ingram, which is, they, they distribute books for all of the big companies and, and She Rice Press as well. So uh, I'm very pleased with them, but I think that anybody who is embarking on publishing a novel or a book has to do a lot of research to really find a way to, to make it happen. It's, yeah, the, the yeah. distribution element is so critical. It is. It doesn't matter who, who the publisher is if it's right. not able to get out to anybody. Exactly, exactly. And Ingram is the gold standard. They are the mm -hmm. ones that they, pub, they distribute to libraries, they distribute to bookstores, they distribute to Amazon and Barnes and Noble and big companies and small companies, so. Uh, so the perpetual question for writers, um, do you have plans for a sequel? And if not, what's your next project? <laughs> you know, a couple of people have asked me about sequels because they love the characters so much. I really had not thought of this book as a, a um, you know, a book that had sequels. Um, maybe I'll start thinking about it though. Um, I interested, I have two projects in mind. One is I started several years ago and I have half written, and that is actually, if you could believe it, a mystery because I love reading mysteries. And I, um, so I have this um, half written mystery, which I would love very much to finish. And the other is uh, again, an idea that I had for a historical novel that I got uh, several years ago and that has really been percolating. Historical novels require a lot of research <laughs> and they take a lot of time. So, um, but those are the two things I'm thinking of. And uh, unless somebody says to me, you have to write a sequel about Morris or about a prequel or, a, you know, uh, and I think this is a uh, standalone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what's the critical response been so far? I know you mentioned you got your first Kirkus review. I did, I got a Kirkus review. Um, well, the, everything, all the reviews have been great. Go on Amazon, go on Goodreads, you can see them. Um, it's very hard for independent authors to get reviewed by the New York Times uh, or uh, you know any of the major um, the like New York Review of books and so mm -hmm. on. However, um, I have, the book is, is out in several places that are doing reviews of them. So far, everything has been really great, but the best part has been the readers. Um, I, I have been, you know, getting people who read, have read the book or are reading the book who are emailing me and calling me and telling me that they love it and they can't put it down. And that to me is the absolute best review that I could get. And I've been very, very pleased with the reader's responses. So. No, that's wonderful. I mean, I, I enjoyed um, burning through it over my weekend and it was <laughs> uh, exactly what I wanted to, to spend my time doing. Um, well, thank you. So thank thank you. you for that. Yeah. Uh, I want to point out that you can get a copy of How to Make a Life from uh, Arcade Bookstore. Please support our, our local Absolutely. You can also, um, if you're interested in online purchasing, look at bookshop.org, which supports independent bookstores across um, the country and is a great way to get uh, uh, books of all sorts, including How to Make a Life. Um, and you can also visit Barnes and Noble and Amazon. Right. Um, but I, I want to just say something. Do I very much want people to support their independent bookstores? Very, very much. I had a very, I don't know whether to say it's a, it was a, a great experience or, or not, but the day after the launch, which was two weeks ago, my publisher uh, got in touch with me and said that um, there were almost no books left in the warehouse because Amazon had purchased, I don't know, 700 or 800 of the books. I have no idea why. They have some kind of an algorithm, but they, you know, it, a lot of the small independent bookstores, 
who had put in orders earlier had them, but then now they have to wait because we're doing a second publishing. We're doing a, a second printing, I should say. That's so, it's, um, so that's the good news and the bad news. So <laughs> if you order it from, from the Indies, you may have to wait a week or two. Uh, one, one last question that came in was, um, how do you pursue making this a TV series? It would be a fantastic television <laughs> show. Uh, you know, you're, I've had four or five people tell me that. If you know someone who is a, 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 um, a what do you call it, a producer, tell me. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have no idea how you would do it. So, um, but it is, it probably has a, you know, the, the characters are interesting enough. It, it could make a, a short ser series. Uh, Mark and Judy, I think um, maybe what a future library program will be, will be all about the publicity and um, next stages in, in what that, what those processes look like for authors. So very- I think that's a great idea. One. You know, that is really, really a good idea, Chris. Because, uh, yeah, it's, people don't have a, any idea. You know, it's sort of like, okay, I have a book now. Now what? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that'll probably be the, the title. That's of, the title. Uh, there you go. The I wrote a book. Now what? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you so much, Florence, for uh, your time tonight, for coming out and for speaking with me. Uh, thank you for sharing with us an amazing story about families um, that we can all see ourselves within. Um, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. A round of applause for me since <laughs> my microphone is the one that's on. Um, and uh, again, grab a copy from Patrick from Amazon, uh, from bookshop.org. Uh, and um, we have a copy, I don't know if our copy is on the shelf or um, out and about in the community, but you can get it from the Rye Free Reading Room as well. Um, so again, thank you everybody for coming out and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much, Chris. I enjoyed talking to you. Of course, thank you. Um...